Hello and welcome. This is the first lecture in the course Computer Science in Climate and Ocean Research. My name is Thomas Lavik, and we start with an introduction to the topic. I will speak about the topics of the module and then we will start with yeah, an introduction into the structure of the climate system in its components. I will talk about the mathematical formulation of climate models in a continuous and in a time discrete setting. And at the end, I will speak a little bit about programming languages that are used in climate research. Yeah, this course, Computer Science for Ocean and Climate Research, has the main topic that we study methods, techniques and algorithms that are used in the field of ocean and climate science and methods, techniques and algorithms from computer science. Yeah, why do we study this? Because the climate science is an important and growing research area motivated by global warming, the discussion about global warming, but not only by this. Of course, climate science is a, is a research topic for a very long time with the aim to understand the complicated processes in the climate system. And here in the, in the title of the lecture series, I, I also use ocean because in, in Kiel we have a very strong um, scientific history for ocean research, so ocean is a part of the climate system and this strong history is on one hand in the GEOMAR center and also at the university. But I will speak many often just about climate research because the structure of the models and many topics are similar for climate as a whole and for the ocean as a part of the climate system. Yeah, simulation itself becomes more and more important because we have bigger computers, faster computers, we have more storage, we are able to generate more data and we can also exploit the data that we have, measurement data and simulation data. So there is a growing need for methods of computer science. Yeah, and how does computer science contribute to climate research? One point is, I already mentioned that we have data, data from measurements, data from simulation. And so the analysis of this data is one part where computer science might help. The other point is also very important is it's the simulation of the climate. So for all discussions and predictions of the behavior of future climate, global warming, climate change simulation is important. So the climate system is modeled and then simulation runs are performed to estimate or predict the future. Another point is parameter estimation. One aim is of course that the prediction is very close to the reality and this can be done by if we already have measurements then we can do what's also called a hindcast, so uh, in contrast to forecast. So we do a hindcast, so we take the model that we have, the climate model, we run a simulation, but for a time interval in the past where we have measurements. And then we can compare the output of the climate model with measurements and we can use this to estimate parameters in the climate model model parameters which are maybe not very well known and then we can optimize the model by finding the best parameter which, such that the model predicts the future in the best way. And of course computer science contributes to climate research also in programming and software engineering and parallelization and high performance computing HPC because the climate system or the earth where all this climate happens is very big. So we, if, if we really want to have a detailed simulation, we need uh, very high dimensional models. We need a very fine spatial and temporal resolution. So there we need high performance computers and they work with parallel hardware. And so we need programming, of course, if we want to put a uh, a model on the computer 
And we also need software engineering because, as we will see in this lecture, the climate system is a coupled system with different components and thus also the software is coupled. And uh, one important point is how to do this coupling, how to uh, use appropriate modules such that the software is flexible, it should be reliable and it should be maintainable, of course. Yeah, and if we have these methods of computer science available, then we can on one hand make simulations faster or we can make some simulation tasks feasible at all that are not feasible by now. Because not only the computer hardware is developing, also algorithms are developing. And yeah, as I mentioned, we have data and we can analyze data and use them. We can couple models in a flexible way. We can improve the structure of models. So we will get sustainable software. And yeah, the ocean, as I already mentioned, is an important part of the climate system and one research focus in Kiel. And we cannot treat all of these topics in this module, but what we do is we, we, you will learn a little bit about the climate system, not that deeply, but the basic structure of climate models, the basic structure of a climate simulation you should understand. Yeah, and you should understand how the methods of computer science can be used. <clears throat> and by yeah, construction of this module, this is an interdisciplinary work. So if you might have someone who is not coming from computer science, but coming from, from climate physics or some other discipline, it will be very interesting to discuss this. And uh, both communities, of course, can benefit from each other. So the people from computer science can learn very many things about the climate models, the climate system, and how they are really implemented in reality. So how the climate researchers use their software. And on the other hand, people from climate science can uh, learn how computer scientists look at software and what they do to analyze and improve software. And there's also a mathematical background, of course, because you will see this in a second we are dealing with mathematical equations because a climate model is a mathematical problem. It can be written down in mathematics and the simulation, of course, is just a translation of these mathematics into computer code and then running this code. Okay, so we start with the climate system. The first thing, maybe the, the term climate, there's a difference, of course, between climate and weather. And the basic difference is there are different scales in space and time. So when we are talking about climate, we are often talking about global temperature, for example. The temperature is a, is a quantity which is always important. Uh, you, you might know about the two degree goal of the uh, of, that is discussed such that the the global mean temperature should not rise above two degrees with respect to a reference uh, time, a reference year. So, and, and then we are in, in this two degree goal is we are not talking about the weather in Kiel or about the temperature in Kiel. We are mainly talking about global averages. So this is a different scale in space. And there's also a different scale in time when we're talking about climate because we are, main, we are then talking about also an annual mean temperature. This is a very uh, interesting quantity. You will see it in a picture in, in a minute, the global mean, the annual global mean temperature. On the other hand, when we are talking about weather, I might be interested in, in the weather of tomorrow in Kiel, which is spatially and, lo uh, and, and um, temporally very local. So tomorrow is a very short time horizon that I have and also in Kiel is a very small spatial region. The climate system is basically forced from outside only by solar radiation. 
there might be some impacts by some uh, space objects uh, that, that in the past hit the Earth, but this is, can be neglected. So ba the basic force for the climate system of the Earth is solar radiation. Solar radiation is changing on long, long time scales due to the variation of the Earth's orbit. There's the theory behind this. There are some, some cycles and also the, the um, solar, solar spots uh, have a different uh, intensity and this also needs to long time scales of variation in the Earth's radiation or in the solar radiation which is um, coming to Earth. So these are um, cycles of or time scales which go into uh, ten thousands of years or so which are not that important when we're doing climate simulation only for let's say only <laughs> for hundred years. But of course people also use climate simulation for the last glacial cycle, which is 120,000 years, and there the variation in the Earth's orbit are important. But these are unknown, and there is some theory behind. We don't go into detail here. It's just a background information. And of course, there are annual changes due to the Earth's orbit and daily changes due to the Earth's rotation, which result in a different behavior or a different uh, incoming radiation in different regions of the Earth. The climate system, yeah, many people say the climate system is in a stable dynamical state, which is might sound a little bit like a contradiction. It's of course it's a dynamical state, so there is no steady climate because we have the the changes that I mentioned, the annual changes, the daily changes. Stable in some sense, yeah, because if, if it would be completely unstable, we were not, uh, we would not be alive. So yeah, we observe these cycles, but what's important, we also see some additional internal variability. El Nino is, is one example for this, because it can be easily explained that there is an annual cycle, because in one year, the Earth uh, is, uh, makes one orbit around the uh, one cycle around the the sun, um, and of course also daily cycle can be very easily uh, explained by the Earth's rotation. But these are the the outcome the cycles coming from outside, which is one day and one year. Additionally, we might have these variations in the long time scale variation in the solar radiation. But the El Nino has a, has a cycle of, of about seven years, so and, and there is nothing in coming from outside that has a, a, a periodicity of seven years. So and this is called an internal variability, and there is more of this. And yeah, long time differences in climate, so glacial cycles, I already mentioned, this, they are there. And it's very difficult to understand um, how this happens. Just an example, this is a picture of the global mean temperature and of measurements for the last uh, one million years, which can be called reconstructed for measurements. And you see that there are some uh, yeah, fluctuations or uh, periodic or more or less periodic, some ups and downs. But look here, this is thousands of years before present. But you see here also the last glacial maximum. And you see here that there are changes and, and how much these changes are. So this is a typical behavior. It's a, if we would look at, at single years, of course, we, we don't see this that much. But here in the long, if we re really use this long time scale, we see differences of 10 degrees or even more. And another picture I want to show is just, you already know this, global warming. There is a correlation between the global temperature and the atmospheric CO2. And uh, the, uh, the, the, here you see the changing of the temperature. And here you see the CO2 concentration. The blue line is a CO2 concentration. This 
a green or gray line is the measured temperature and because some some about some people say the the uh, rising of the temperature that could be observed in the last 40 years here is just because of solar radiation you see uh, uh, the the yellow line or orange line this is the change in solar radiation so there is a correlation between co2 in the atmosphere and uh, temperature that can be measured and this is what a typical picture uh, this is by stefan ramsdorf from uh, potsdam and um, this is a typical picture yeah that that is an indicator that we better deal somehow with a global warming and co2 output yeah or emissions and and this is a, a, a backup of all the discussions that we are talking about reducing co2 to emissions i want to come back to this uh, internal variability that i mentioned um, and this is a very simple example it has nothing to do with climate research it's just um, a, a very simple equation and for some of you differential equation might be um, new we will come to this later because climate models are differential equations and this is an example but here the point is the internal variability and what i mean by this is uh, we have a system a model where the forcing as climate people say so the the parameters that determining the system from outside some constants or other things they are constant so there is no variability in time in the constants but still the system so the solution of the equation they have a periodic structure this is one example so this happens not only in climate research that we have el nino or something it happens in it's a mathematical property uh, so then what i want to say is that internal variability can appear in a system even though the system data are time independent and the example is the oscillation of a spring or pendulum without friction. And um, x is the spatial coordinate at time t, x of t, so it's a function. And the behavior is described, this is a phys simple physics, and it's even simplified, this equation for the, for the pendulum, um, by differential equation where the second derivative of the spatial coordinate, so the, the acceleration, of the spatial coordinate of the spring or the pendulum is appearing and then there it's related to the yeah to the spatial coordinate itself so if if i uh, pulling at the string and uh, a spring not string a spring and uh, i increase the x then this determines the acceleration if, if i then uh, let it uh, go the, the spring or the pendulum themselves uh, or it's the same for the pendulum um, and there's one parameter inside this omega squared so omega is a given constant or is a real number and you see here is the, the solution of course is uh, the solution is x of t describing the spatial coordinate at time t of course this is time dependent but nothing else here, the forcing or the parameter, this omega, is not time dependent, it's a constant, and there's a zero on the right hand side. So there's nothing from outside in the system which has some temporal dependency. And there is an, if I have now an initial value, an arbitrary, there is no periodicity in the, in the equation or in the data, but there is in the solution, which you can easily check because the solution is a cosine. Um, if I just, if I, in the easiest case where x0 is 1, this is the example because the x0 is just uh, a factor on the solution. So if the x0 is 1, then I have this solution x of t is cosine omega t. And if you now know the simple derivative rules for cosine, you see the, that the second um, derivative exactly gives minus omega square x of t such that is a, it is a solution to this equation and here you have uh, a periodic function so you have internal variability even though the system from outside has no time dependent coefficient and this is a very simple example um, 
And this is the only solution which can be shown from mathematics that this is the only solution that there is. And that's what you see in a pendulum. It's, it's, there's a, if there is no friction, then it will, uh, it will move forever and always uh, turn from one side to the other side, or the spring will, will always turn uh, up and down, and there's a periodic um, spatial coordinate. Okay, now coming to the climate system, we start with the components of the climate system. And here's a picture. I wanted to have a picture from, uh, from the IPCC report, the Inter, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so with, which is a consortium of, of scientists all over the world which produce reports. Uh, you might have heard this and they have very nice pictures in their reports but since i want to publish this here in in on the internet i i use my own picture which is not that nice uh, because there is in fact it's just a schematic the components of the climate system they can be very easily defined you have the we have the atmosphere we have the ocean and then we have the land surface we have the land biosphere we have ice on land and on the sea we have in the ocean yeah which can be uh, looked at is a marine biosphere so plankton animals and we have a hydrosphere which includes the ocean but there's also seas and and rivers and there's a lot of interaction so on one hand there are many components on the other hand they, if you look out of the window and or, or on, a, on a map, you will see, of course, uh, you, you can say it's very easy to understand that there is an ocean component and an atmosphere component and there is a land biosphere. So the, the structure of the, of the climate system or to identify components is not that difficult. We will see later that this is reflected in the climate models, of course, and the coupling is also very important. For example, from atmosphere to ocean is very important with respect to this CO2 uptake, because uh, CO2 emissions and uptake, because the ocean takes takes up CO2 from the atmosphere, and this is a chemical process happening at the interface, at the sea surface, which is not that easy to understand and which somehow has to be modeled. For example. Now we're going a little bit more in direction of climate models because as computer scientists we, we want to look or we basically look at simulation or data from climate models. The climate system is time dependent so the mathematical formulation of a climate model is what's called an initial value problem for a system of ordinary differential equations. I want to explain both of these terms. Starting with the differential equation. A differential equation is an equation for an unknown function y. You can always think as uh, for temperature, global mean temperature. It's a function of time. T might be now the years, and we are interested in how the temperature evolves with respect to time. But the equation that we have is an equation where the derivative of this function appears. That's a y dot here. So it's a time derivative. The definition is here. You know how the derivative is defined. In the, it's a limit. And we have different uh, notations for it. I used here the dot. It's often used in physics for the time derivative. But you might as well use just the prime. And maybe I will also use it later. So it's just two different notations for the same thing and also this differential quotient dy dt is used. So it's a limit process and or a limit uh, and in our equation we have the unknown function itself and we have the derivative. This makes it complicated and on the right hand side we have can have a function of a function f of our unknown function. So you might be just it might stand y squared or something. It can be a very complicated function and this makes the system difficult to solve or the equation difficult to solve. 
there can be also an explicit dependency on t on the right hand side on this f if it's called the right hand side or we in climate modeling we call it also the model model function and this equation is valid for t bigger for the time bigger than some initial time instance can be zero you can always think here as a zero so we have an equation and we cannot directly solve it in usually because we have the derivative inside and the function itself and it can be the global mean temperature ordinary differential equation means that we have just one derivative so that means a derivative with respect to one variable here it's t the time in climate models later on we will have also spatial derivatives because we have a spatial distribution of effects then we will have a partial differential equation but this is not our topic up to now so this means the ordinary so this is an ordinary differential equation ode and what we always need uh, maybe this to um, in most climate models we have vector valued functions so we're not in, in the simple case when i'm looking for global mean temperature at time i have just one value y of t is one scalar function but if i'm talking about spatially distributed things or i want to compute temperature and pressure maybe in the air then i have two variables and then we have vector valued functions y here that we are looking for and a vector valued right hand side f then we call this a system of odes so this is a system then of odes and the model function or the right hand side might depend on additional parameters whatever but the initial value problem is the thing that we really solve because we need an initial value to be given to solve this ODE because um, if there is you, somehow we want to compute up from uh, from this uh, in time instance t0 and we need some value at which we start you cannot compute a climate simulation from now to 100 years uh, in the future if you don't know the state that the climate system is now at least approximately or at some points and this together then the differential equation together with the initial value is called an initial value problem this is the basic mathematic formulation of a climate model and there is i want to give a very simple example which is our first simulation example uh, it's a zero dimensional energy balance model ebm zero dimensional means the model treats the earth as one point in space and the model is based on a balance between the incoming and outcoming outgoing radiation on earth so the solar energy and this is a typical modeling principle it's a conservation property or balance equation the same energy is come going in as it's coming out and that in this model there's only one ver one variable this is the global mean temperature y as y of t as a function of time and the ODE then looks like this we have the same structure the temporal change of uh, the yeah of the temperature is described by a model function and this model function looks like this you see here is a constant part we have different constants here or parameters c1 s alpha c2 and then we have here the unknown function itself y to the power of 4 so this is a simple example but it's e it's already non-linear so it's not that easy this equation but it's just one equation a one-dimensional ODE and we have some parameters as I mentioned s is what's called yeah it's a description or a quantification of the energy prefer surface area which is coming from the solar radiation it's also called solar constant but we know it's not completely constant and there's a unit for this this is not that important up to now then the second parameter albedo is between zero and one has no unit because it's just the portion or the part of reflection of the incoming radiation so ice for example or snow reflects much of the incoming radiation and um, wood or just soil reflects less 
which is important, of course, if ice is melting, then the albedo, albedo would be smaller and the, the amount of incoming energy is growing. And there are some other constants which I don't want to discuss here because there, of course, this is coming from a physical property and balance of energy and there have to be units and um, accordingly we have to choose some or we have to define some model constants. But this is not the point. This is an example for a uh, very simple climate model. It, we call this a continuous model because the time is still continuous and the time derivative is still present in the model. So this is more a mathematical object. We cannot put this on the computer directly. If we have some good tools, we can yeah, somehow do this, but then all the interesting things are happening inside to time discrete models. Because on the computer, of course, we have to discretize the time. We cannot compute a continuous model with the whole uh, time interval on the real axis, we have to discretize the time. And we do it like this. We just fix a time step size and then we divide our time interval. Let's say we want to compute the solution from T0 to capital T, let's say from today, from T to date until the, uh, the next hundred years, then we compute or we, we choose a time interval, a time step, which is always the same. And just, then we just take some time instance, let's say one year, for example, for our energy balance model. And then we approximate the derivative. So we replace the limit process and the definition of the derivative here, this limit, we use just a fixed step size delta t and this delta t that we have here. This is then an approximation of the derivative and the, uh, the accuracy depends somehow on the method, how we approximate the derivative and how big the step size is. This is a mathematical topic that we don't discuss now. But we have now a discretization of the derivative. And if we take now here the leftmost term and the rightmost term, we can build an algorithm out of it because we have yk plus 1 we can compute from the remaining terms if we know the model function. And this is called an explicit Euler or the explicit Euler method. We start by uh, t0, where we have an initial value y0, and then we compute proceeding in time step by step with the step size delta. We have here the explicit Euler method, which is the simplest time stepping for t in this interval. We can write it like this here. We have the increment in the solution or in the approximative solution. and. We can also write it here that, that we include the, the increment in the time step. But of course, since we have the same time steps, we can compute it beforehand what the time steps are. And nearly all climate models have this structure so that we have some kind of time loop. It might be different because the method may, might be a little bit more complicated or more sophisticated here, but the structure is the same. At the end, we get an approximation of our solution, a vector. And the solution can be a scalar. So yk can be a scalar, for example, for the EBM. But of course, <coughs> every solution at one time instance can also be a vector. Let's say we have a spatial distribution of the uh, temperature on the Earth. Then we would have every yk would be a vector. And then, of course, this will get uh, will become some, some matrix or some different data structure. And yeah, vectors uh, already mentioned we can get if we have different points in space, but also if we have different quantities, temperature, pressure, velocity in ocean model. And because Earth uh, is very big and if we compute an ocean model, we have a very uh, want to have a very fine resolution in space and we have time dependency, then we have in fact 4D data at the end and we might have several variables. So there's another dimension. So we end up with a high dimensional problem, which is the reason why we use high performance computers. And we have to define or design a very good and fast algorithm to solve these kind of problems because of the high dimension and because of the internal variability that I mentioned. But this is a basic structure. And 
you can see this in a climate model. This is a climate model where, where you can find the components and also the time loop. It's in Fortran, we come to this programming language later on. It's, it's not very important that you understand this, but you have here some init and you have some time loop in the, in the model. And you have here a time loop where here's a loop in Fortran of steps and there's a time step is called. And in the time step, you can see that there is an atmospheric model, there's a coupling model, and there's an ocean model, for example. They, so in, in a climate model, you will find this structure. You will find the structure of this time integration, and you will also find the structure of the climate model somehow, and the coupling. Okay. And at last part of this lecture, I will want to talk a little bit about programming languages that are used in climate research. And of course, there are lots of lot of programming languages. And if you are computer scientists, you know all the concepts and paradigms. So there are imperative ones, functional ones, logical ones, there are query languages, procedural or structural, object-oriented programming, and uh, modern languages usually combining and integrating different of these paradigms. And I don't go into the details here, but, but uh, yeah, you, you have learned languages and most of you will learn an imperative language, my, maybe an object-oriented languages. But uh, for example, in Java, uh, since sometimes there's also functional aspects or functional constructs in this language. So uh, modern languages, they try to combine this. And for us, it's important what, what is used in climate science. And the second point with respect to computer language is, uh, yeah, it's also related to performance. And this is if, if the language is compiled or interpreted. So the compiled languages, there you need a compiler, and here I use always the example here C. So you write the source code, you compile it, and then there's an object code, then there's a linker, and you get a machine code that you usually don't look at, you just execute it and you get a result. So Fortran, C, C++ are examples for these kind of languages. On the other hand, there are the interpreted languages, for example, MATLAB or OCTAV or R or also Python is something like this, where you write a source code or a script and then you just put it into an interpreter and the interpreter internally generates a machine code and displays you the result. And these are the two extreme points <clears throat> Java, for example, is a mixture because the source code there is compiled. You have this bytecode, the class files, and then the virtual machine interprets or converts this to machine code and produces results. And Python also generates a bytecode in this PYC files in the first interpretation of the script. So it's, it's, it's a little bit similar to this. And the main point that we that is important for us here in climate research is that compiled languages are faster in runtime. Whereas interpreted languages are faster for writing and testing because often no variable declaration is necessary. You can, in, in MATLAB, you can just write x equal one and you don't have to declare x as an integer or double or float or whatever variable. You can just start it. And of course, it's easier for prototyping for testing, but the runtime usually is worse. And there are also ideas to combine both advantages with what's sometimes termed just in tile compilation or compile during runtime. And also MATLAB, for example, does this, that, that internal machine code is stored after the four first run and then the, in the second run it will be faster, the execu execution will be faster. So this is important because usually we are interested, uh, you know, usually we're interested in both in fast runtime and, and fast uh, testing, but at the end, the climate model needs fast runtime or short runtime. 
And th that means that we are more in this area here for complex climate models. So for complex climate models will be written in C or Fortran. Most of them are Fortran and that's the reason why we will discuss this language also in this course. Yeah, so for scientific programming, so uh, or computational science, where, where there are simulation runs like climate or physical, technical computations, economic computations, um, we use higher programming languages, which are these Fortran, C, C++, Java is also something, but Java is, is not uh, that efficient. Pascal is not used anymore. We, they have more abstraction than the machine language. So these languages were invented to, to avoid uh, that we have to program on the machine level in assembler or something. They have control structure. The coding is faster than in a machine language, but they have to be compiled uh, to or interpreted uh, in, to obtain machine code. And this leads to a machine or platform dependency also maybe to compiler dependency. And another term is that general purpose languages, domain specific languages is, is one point because domain specific languages are also would be very interesting for scientific programming because it's, it's a language with a higher abstraction level. For example, MATLAB is, can be seen as a, as a DSL because it's designed for, yeah, for scientific programming basically or data analysis. Far, again, the, the prototyping is faster, but they're usually slower. And I already mentioned this idea to combine this. Julia is a very interesting concept, which has a MATLAB-like syntax, but should be faster. And as I already mentioned, climate models are high dimensional. So we need the higher programming languages for simulation runs. We need something which is compiled, basically. Um, Scripting languages are more used for simple models, for visualization or for data analysis. Yeah, and this is the end of the first lecture. What is important? What do I think is important? The climate system is a dynamic system with several components. And both properties can be seen in structure of climate models. That is, they are transient models. There will be a time loop inside. And they're coupled models with different components and also software components. An uh, um, exception would be this energy balance model, which is very simplified. Yeah, there are two mathematical formulations. There is an initial value problem for all systems of ODEs, ordinary differential equations. This is continuous in time. This is more a mathematical formulation for analysis. And discrete in time, of course, is also mathematical, but we can use it for simulation on the computer because that, this discrete formulation in time we can program. Um, yeah, the simplest method we have seen, the explicit Euler method for, for uh, an ordinary differential equation and for the programming of climate model, higher programming languages for fast runtime and scripting languages for prototyping and visual visualization or data analysis. Okay, and this is the first lecture.